Um, favorite movies? I don't really have a favorite movie. I hate to be difficult. Louis Lumiere, a photographic plate maker from Paris, invented the first camera capable of motion picture. He called it the cinematograph. Louis and his brother Auguste Lumiere modified the cinematograph so that it could project the movies that it shot as well. That is where the movie industry started. Traditionally, the process of film production and cinema consists of planning out a storyboard, writing a script and screenplay, filming the movie using cameras that shoot on film stock, editing the footage, and finally projecting the finished version of the movie for an audience to view. This is how we have adapted to storytelling through motion picture for over 87 years. A whole culture is formed around film, spawning purists, fanatics, and archivists. Digital. In 1982, Sony released the Betamax camera, capable of digital video. By 1985, VHS had become the new visual medium. Digital video recording has already taken over the television and documentary industry. It has now slowly started to intrude on the cinema industry, and many filmmakers believe digital has no place in cinema. I mean, I actually think I'm getting gypped when I go to a movie and I realize it's either been shot on digital or being projected in digital. Cheaper, faster, is consumed, bang, goes away. There's nothing. There's no nourishment. And someday even I will have to convert, but right now I love shooting on film. I love film. As you can see, the use of film is still vastly relevant in the movie industry today. But the argument that shooting on digital is more efficient than producing on film is what's influencing filmmakers to make the switch. In my research, I have found a more than qualified candidate to support the film industry. His name is Steve Sanguidolci. I was given a movie camera when I was 13 years old by my uncle as a kind of first communion gift. And uh, ironically, it kind of became my tool of choice. I remember being in high school and not really liking academia, although I was good at it. I really liked exploring the arts. So since I started making movies, it really opened up a world of kind of exploration. It kind of gave me a sense of autonomy and an understanding of um, where I belong. You know, I didn't never really felt like I was going to be a business person or a corporate person or a legal person or a money person, but I really did want to make work. And I didn't know what the arts were, you know, because high school, taught art is often just live realistic drawing right like live action drawing and stuff um, uh, still lifes and things and I was never good at that but I did like the idea of exploring images and um, so movies have kind of consumed the way of being able to tell stories you know um, when you think about it really cinema is 120 125 years old so compared to the other arts it's it's kind of still in its diapers. It's still an infant. It's still being discovered. So I feel like my job is to kind of, and artists' jobs are to kind of reinvent or continually invent what the language of cinema is. And because it's so young, it's kind of naive to think that film is has fallen into a specific shape. Hollywood dominant, you know, right now it's superhero Marvel films or whatever it was five years ago with Tarantino-esque stuff. But that the language of cinema is ever evolving. And I like to think that films are really the closest thing we have to kind of representing our dreams and kind of ideas, fantasies, nightmares, um, all sorts of ideas. So it's, um, it's kind of allowed me to dig into a kind of personal aesthetic 
Um, and it's turned into a career. You know, I kind of approached it as a hobby because I liked it better than doing accounting. I was always good in math and my, you know, counselor said you should become a bookkeeper, which I think would have definitely resulted in some kind of tragedy. You know, it's funny because you look at old work and some of it doesn't hold up. It's like the sense of time has changed. So you watch old black and white classics and they're interminable, basically. They move slowly, they're more theatrical in their presentation, kind of like the fourth wall. And so in some ways, cinema and movies have changed the way our consciousness works. And a great example is YouTube. Right. So now that what people have done is there's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, vines. Is that what they're called? The vines. Yeah. Seven second clips where everything gets reduced to this kind of seven second. I'm not going to call it a haiku, but in some way it gets paired right down. So there's a different sense in terms of how we experience time and a different sense in our sophistication as, as a viewer, as an audience member. So it seems as though um, the shape of films has changed the shape in which we think and the way in which we experience the world. So, you know, back to the YouTube example, it's like you look at what YouTube really offers and they're short sound bites, cut to the chase, get right to the point. Long winded, difficult, rigorous, contemplative pieces don't typically hold up. You need your kind of, you know, committed viewer to sit through 70 minutes of, you know, let's say a lecture or something that's more poetic or something that's more contemplative, right? So it's changed the way, and I see it in my students, like our, our tension span has, has shifted, that it's tougher to maintain a similar kind of focus on something that's not as, let's say, action-packed or evolving or moving or dynamic or... So I think it, in some ways, cinema has changed the way in which we think. The idea was, you know, 40 years ago, you needed to be a rich white dude in Hollywood to get your film produced. Now you can be some poor, you know, to quote Coppola, a little girl, 11 year old girl in Iowa or Idaho, making a movie on your video camera, your digital camera. Um, so it, the power dynamic has, ch has changed. So now it means that everybody has not quite equal access, but everybody has access to telling stories. So if I'm, you know, living in some remote village and I've got a video camera, I could speak, I could, you know, present my uh, opinions, ideas, documentary, stories. So I like that cinema has changed in the way in which we are able to communicate, that everybody has access to voice, to, you know, presenting idea. Um, of course, there's still the kind of hierarchy of making the big budget films and you've got to go through those channels and some of them are not so pleasant as we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, but the notion that people have the ability to tell their own story, I think is phenomenal. The notion that it's kind of equalized in terms of power, everybody has access to making movies. I think that's fantastic. So you can have, you know, low tech docs coming out of a, a place that typically w would never have been able to be produced 30 years ago. So I like that the power has equaled out in that regard. I, I guess how cinema has changed, you know, aesthetically we talked about. Um, and I guess, you know, it's it's moved in some regards in the last even 20 years that it went from like this kind of spiritual dark room with a white light where everybody kind of revered. It's almost religious in its sense. Come to a room, look at a white light, everybody focus. It's like, that's our God. It's like the new God in some way, proverbial God. Um, so in the way in which we've changed the way in which we celebrate cinema, now it's mostly individual. It's on our personal devices, whether it's home screens or computers or even, you know, iPhones. I don't know. Can you watch films on iWatches? I hope not. So the idea that is, is, is it's changed from a communal experience too into this more private one. Of course, people still go out to the theaters, but those numbers have changed. You see, most film consumption now is done alone. People will just, you know, download something or check something out on Netflix or go to sites and watch stuff. So we've lost some of that communal space. And it's ironic because when you, when I watch a film in a theater, I have a way 
longer recollection of that movie when I'm in the theater than when I'm watching something broadcast or even at home you know, through whatever computer channel I might have or Netflix or some download. There's something about being in a physical space with the theater that gives it, a, a, I guess, a larger kind of resonance in that regard. So I think it's changed the way in which we watch movies, the way in which we think, and the kind of voice that uh, people have, that equity to power. My name's Steve Sanguidolci. Um, favorite movies? I don't really have a favorite movie. I hate to be difficult. I have several that were kind of influential. You know, I remember watching a couple of Derek Jarman films, British filmmaker, and he makes these long form, kind of abstract, poetic pieces, often without words, kind of punk sensibility. Um, he did a film called Last of England and The Garden and angelic conversation. So those three movies kind of rock me because they kind of opened up a way of telling stories that isn't really like normal films that you might see elsewhere. So I, I like Jarman's work. I like Jean-Luc Godard just because he pushes boundaries. And, um, and Fellini was also, you know, surrealist and um, interesting in that regard. But I don't, you know, I also like Stan Brakhage's abstract films that are more like moving paintings than movies, than traditional kind of fictional narratives. So um, yeah, I never really had a favorite. I guess I just like different people's work that kind of moved me. We had a film screen education course in grade 12. And that was rare then because it was super eight cameras. Uh, not, not many schools had them, but it really opened up this world of being able to explore language of telling stories or telling dreams or making visual poems so um, and ironically it turned into a teaching career you know I teach now um, but I never anticipated I didn't go into school in fact you know I teach in a university I don't even have a degree right so it kind of parlayed itself into kind of a life uh, kind of pursuit of making work and you know being fortunate enough to live in Canada where this kind of work can get support. I've been lucky that my films have had some, you know, subsidy from our arts councils. You know, I call my films invisible cinema because very few people see them. So, um, but it really is kind of like the notion of jazz that it's critically well received and well acclaimed and uh, respected, but there's small audiences and you're not, most people don't make a, a great living from just the work. You have to do something else. I actually think I'm getting gypped when I go to a movie and I realize it's either been shot on digital or being projected in digital. The magic of movies is connected to 35 millimeter because everyone thinks, you can't help but think, that when you're filming something on film that you're recording movement. You're not recording movement. You are just taking a series of still pictures. There's no movement in movies at all. They are still pictures. But when shown at 24 frames a second, through a light bulb, it creates the illusion of movement. So thus, as opposed to a recording device, when you're watching a movie, a film print, you are watching an illusion. And to me, that illusion is connected to the magic of movies. Well, that, that's, that's the problem with the digital in the sense, I mean, a, 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 another aspect, I should say, not a problem, but another aspect one has to think, that this idea of the image that is digitized and you think will always be there and it's cheaper and it's faster. Anything cheaper and faster, it makes sense for the businessman to finance, you know? But the danger, especially I think in our culture, is that a cheaper, faster, is consumed, bang, goes away. There's nothing, there's no nourishment. And so that's the danger. Yes, to be cheaper and faster so that it can enable us to enrich a culture rather than just consume it. Um, but you know, digital cinema is inevitable. It's right around the corner. And someday even I will have to convert, but right now I love shooting on film. I love film. So just the notion of digital versus um, sprocket or analog film, you know, that's a kind of a tough shift because there's parts of film culture that refuse to die, like Super 8 simply does not want to die. 
Kodak just reissued a brand new Super 8 stock from the 80s. They reissued last year, two years ago. It's radical that Super 8 could stay alive. Artists have always used it, whether it's music videos, even in big theatrical feature films. There's always a Super 8, often a Super 8 sequence in them. Um, and you know, I work in analog. I still shoot films and hand develop and hand color my movies. Um, but it's becoming harder and harder. So the notion is that as the market shifts, we'll all be forced to work with a mouse, basically. We'll all be forced to go digital. And that's okay on some levels. You know, I'm, I, hopefully the artisans can still access their tools to be able to shoot film or, it's, you know, if you've spent 30 years of your life painting with a paintbrush, of course you could paint with a mouse, but it's a whole different activity altogether. Thank you, Steve. You have just summarized my documentary. The point is, every art form comes with its own set of tools. And once you improve those tools to a certain extent, the art itself loses its purpose and value. Yes, it's easier. Yes, it's faster. In some ways, it's cheaper. In some ways, it's not. I think that's a myth. Um, because you still have to pay people, crews, locations, equipment, time, food, all that stuff. All you're really saving on is the hard costs of sprocket, film, and the labs, which is significant. Um, so the idea is that, yeah, it's cheaper to make work digitally. It looks phenomenal. Maybe a little too hyper real for my generation. And you look at high def, you know, 4K, 8K video, it's hyper real. So the idea is that we're all moving towards a digital kind of technology. It's inevitable. We have to kind of adapt. Hopefully we can maintain enough of the analog to keep it alive. You know, the myth about the money with digital is that it's cheaper. I think on some levels it's true. Once you have your gear, you're kind of good to go. The thing is, once you start getting with actors and locations, you still have to buy those things. So you're saving some money. Um, the notion that digital is faster, you know, I have a flatbed in the other room, a steam back where I used to cut my sprocket films on. Um, now I cut everything digitally. And I don't think it was the technology that slowed me down. Yeah, it's way faster to assemble a sequence digitally. It's way faster to work digitally, but that's not what determines how fast I put out a film. It's, I think it's really my brain that slows me down. It's my ability to understand what the piece is, what I'm doing with it, what I can, how I can execute it. So as much as the technology allows you to work quickly, I don't think that changes the way I'm ready to put stuff out. I guess the problem is the technology always changes. So when you buy a digital camera, for instance, it's probably obsolete as you leave the showroom. Just like buying a phone or a computer. It's already, it's built in. When I buy a microphone or a speaker or something analog, I can count on that for 30 years. That technology has kind of leveled off. So, you know, when people bought 35 millimeter projectors to show movies and theaters, yeah, there were 70 grand in the 70s, exorbitant cost. You bought, you know, a house with that much money. Um, but they lasted 40 years. Now you buy, you know, a 2K Christie projector and it's 200,000 bucks. It's like, oh, okay, that's obsolete in five years. So there is that whole kind of obsolescence where as much as you might think it's cheaper just because the technology's always shifting, like your phone, like your computer, like your camera uh, gear, um, you almost have to stay up with it all the time. You know, I started shooting Super 8 and then 16, mostly 16. Um, and then my films had to get archived. So they had to get archived. First it was to three quarter inch, then it was one inch pneumatic, then it was beta, then it was beta SP, then it was uh, some kind of tape, then it was HD cam, now it's DCP. So every five years, I have to re archive my work because you know dvd and digital software is not really an archival medium ironically the best archival medium that exists is still film so people will archive their work on film and even if film dies as an analog medium for production and post-production it may live on as an archivist's medium because you could shoot something, you know, you look at Melier's early films from the early 1900s and you look at them on film and they look phenomenal. 
You can't do that with digital technology. Your average optical drive, DVD, or CD-ROM has a five-year shelf life. After that, you have to change it. So I think you know it's allowed people to work that otherwise didn't have access to it, what we were talking about earlier in terms of power dissemination, everybody having voice with a simple camera or a phone. It's given voice and news a whole different kind of sensibility because now everybody can make news. You see an event, you capture it, it gets broadcast. We are getting home video as our source. Um, you know, I guess the notion with making feature films digitally, it's the way most people are going. It's cheaper, probably easier to get money to make something uh, digitally than it is to work something with Sprocket. But there's some diehard, you know, filmmakers who have clout and have money who are definitely only interested in shooting Sprocket. And, you know, I applaud them. So Tarantino released the film a couple of years ago and he ensured that 200 film projectors got revamped to show his film. So he single-handedly almost kept, you know, the Sprocket distribution system alive for a few more years. I don't know how that will continue, but the fact that he wanted to show his film in a certain technology, he had all these projectors reserviced. I think it was something like 2000 in the US or, and that's, you know, a big cost. So that's where the costs hurt. Film equipment still exists and they're like tanks. They will run forever. Digital technology changes every five to 10 years. So you could spend 200 grand on a projector and in 10 years, you're gonna have to buy another one for a hundred grand. And then another 10 years, it may be cheaper at 50 grand, but you're always upgrading gear. Um, but yeah, it means you can shoot differently and you can shoot a lot more. And I think it has the largest impact on documentaries because now you can shoot 50 hours. Before, you would never have a documentary unless you know you were less blank. You could shoot a 40 hours, 40 hours of footage to make a one hour doc. Back then, if you had an eight to one shooting ratio on a doc, that was pretty good. You know, now you can go easily 50, 60 to one. It's no big deal. So it allows you to shoot more. Still, I, I'm not sure that's always the best thing. Sometimes having less is more. Language of cinema is ever evolving. And I like to think that films are really the closest thing we have to kind of representing our dreams. Cinema has undergone many changes since 1895. Certain works have become a staple in our culture, inspiring all filmmakers today. The process of telling stories through motion picture has influenced society to speak their mind. And it all started on film. <laughs>